As Melissa mentioned, two weeks before Chogham, uh, Greens Senator Lee Rhiannon and New Zealand Greens MP Jan Logie were expelled from the country. Two weeks before that, two Australian journalists attending a, a seminar on press freedom were expelled from Sri Lanka. Two months before that, um, an Australian man of Sinhalese origin who was uh, back in Colombo to attend the conference of a political party, the Freedom Socialist Party, Frontline Socialist Party, was abducted off the street in one of the infamous white vans. Fortunately, his family made contact with the Australian Embassy and it sort of came to light that he was an Australian citizen before his body ended up on a garbage tip a week later, uh, as is, is typically the case. So we had a succession of events like that leading up to Chogham, which while grim, um, have begun to puncture the silence that has existed in the Australian media about the reality on the ground. We were hoping uh, Lee was going to speak, um, uh, especially given that she'd been, she'd been kicked out of the country, um, uh, but she had to attend to other matters. But um, Scott Ludlam has kindly stepped in for her. Um, we're very glad of that, um, both because Scott's been a strong supporter of our activities um, over the last 18 months or so that we've, we've been established. Um, certainly helped us out with printing and a few other things besides. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that, but um, um, and so we're, we're, we're glad he's back um, and I'd like to invite Scott to take the microphone. Thanks, Sam, um, and thanks for the invite. And hopefully the speaker's not gonna blow up. Um, I'm glad to be here, and I'd just like to apologize on Lee's behalf. Um, she was meant to be in Western Australia, and I know she would have loved to have been here. She's done a tremendous amount of work uh, advocating for justice and peace in Sri Lanka. Uh, and so I'm afraid you're stuck with me for the evening. I didn't really get this issue, although I'd be very supportive of Rand's work uh, and of um, the work on behalf of, of the Tamils and on both sides of that appalling civil war, but I didn't really get it until I saw No Fire Zone last year. And uh, like you'll see in the photographs presented tonight, it kind of hits you in the face. Anybody, if, if you're here and you've not seen that film, it's entirely worthwhile and you walk away from it realising that a vast historic injustice occurred on our watch, under our noses, in our region. Nothing was done at the time. And for the 40 to 70,000 civilians who died in the closing months of that long and horrific conflict, it's too late. We were too late. Uh, but for those who are still uh, suffering the injustice, who have remained behind or who have made their way uh, here or as close to mainland as they've been able to get to, it's not too late and there is something that we can do. Um, as a number of speakers have said, Lee and uh, Jan Logie did um, get into the country last year. They spoke to a lot of people. Lee came back with some pretty hair-raising stories actually about conditions on the ground there. They were detained uh, and they were then deported on their way out and it's reasonably obvious uh, that um, the people that they spoke to, the things that they saw, they did travel up through the northeast of the country and, uh, and get first-hand testimony for people who uh, survived the events of 2009 and before and who were brave enough to talk to them. People who don't then have the luxury of being deported back to a first world country but actually you have to remain behind with the consequences that uh, if we don't do things like that, the word's not going to get out. Um, and the very fact that Australia stayed on the sidelines uh, of the Human Rights Council resolution in the UN, I think, speaks to the indifference um, that the Australian government is now adopting on behalf of all of us to um, the fate of, of what just occurred and the fate of those left behind. The UN definitions, uh, UN's working definition of genocide runs to this. Genocide is a crime of international, oh, sorry, a crime of intentional destruction of a national, ethnic, racial, and religious group in whole or in part. It's not a word that you flip around lightly. Genocide. And that is what appears to have occurred in our region as recently as 2009. Um, last year, a tribunal of 11 eminent judges found that there is a very strong case that the Sri Lankan government is guilty of the crime of continuing genocide. 
continuing genocide, a process that did not conclude in 2009 against the Tamils in Sri Lanka. And so, uh, as a human being and a global citizen, I'm glad that the UN uh, has now made that move and I'm appalled that Australia stayed on the sidelines and in fact at the time um, that that was occurring we're still dealing with the news that we are gifting naval assets to the Sri Lankan government, that we are willing and full participant in Chogham, uh, standing side by side, images of, you know, of, uh, of senior Australian officials shaking the hands of senior regime figures, um, well and truly after the events of 2009 and before were on the public record. And I think the boats give the game away as to what's going on here, because some of the signatories to that Human Rights Council inquiry um, you know, it hasn't come out of left field, the UK, the United States, you know, allies who we would normally be lining up with um, for or against measures like this were on the right side of that resolution and managed to get it up. Mm -hmm. And I think the gift of those patrol boats really gives away what is occurring here. Why we stayed at home uh, is because really overwhelmingly in Australia, the politics of stopping the boats has come to dominate regional foreign policy even where tens of thousands of people are being herded into camps and then bombed. And effectively what we have done in Australia, not just for people fleeing Sri Lanka, but for also for the Hazaras fleeing Afghanistan, for people fleeing the Iranian secret police, is, is seen a burning building, done nothing to put the fire out, and then locked the fire escape. And that is effectively what refugee policy in Australia is now about. We have locked the fire escape on a burning building. And as long as they don't reach these shores, it's treated as other people's problem. So I think to help Sri Lankans, we need to get our own house in order and perhaps help ourselves. I think to go to the heart of how we allowed the egalitarian spirit that is undeniably a part of Australian culture and history to be so profoundly hijacked that we would knowingly lock the fire escape on a burning building and seek to turn away those people who have fled um, the kind of horrors that are so vividly documented here. That means, uh, for my mind, it means a couple of things. It means direct confrontation of those who are wielding that policy, direct confrontation of people like Tony Abbott and Scott Morrison who have so badly degraded the Australian spirit in pursuit of um, undeniable political advantage. In 2001, John Howard rescued the government from uh, almost certain defeat by quite cruelly taking advantage and manipulating uh, Tampa event into a crisis. It's still referred to today as a crisis. And I think last September, we saw the very same politics used to the same ends. So I think we do need direct engagement uh, and direct confrontation, unashamed confrontation, because what is being done to this country shames us all. But I think it also means a vastly better and improved national engagement and listening to people so that we can more, I think, rather than speaking to the already converted, although thank God you're here, uh, that we do need to re-engage with people. Because I think we lost the politics of the event when Abbott and Morrison were able to seize national, justified and humanitarian national anxiety about people drowning in these shitty little boats on their way out of places like Sri Lanka uh, and Afghanistan, managed to manipulate that genuine humanitarian concern for people dying at sea and turning into something very, very different. That's when we lost the politics. And we have two years to win it back. And I think what that is going to mean is getting outside of our comfort zone and talking to people about the kind of experiences that people are fleeing and about the fact that there are other ways of preventing people from taking to sea than becoming a regional human rights abuser. We have two years to do that, I think, and to come up with a foreign policy ambition uh, as part of that that protects human rights everywhere, in Colombo and on Manus Island. And I think the way that we do that effectively, or the result that we would want, at the end of that two-year process of linking arms with people right through the community, uh, including probably some unusual and unfamiliar allies, but also working directly with the affected populations and people who have first-hand stories of what happened in 2009, uh, is to make it absolutely certain that post the 2016 election, you don't get elected by perpetuating racist, fear-mongering bastardry 
on an otherwise decent people. That's our task. Uh, and I really want to thank those who brought us together, everybody put together uh, tonight together is working as a volunteer. Uh, doing this out of, um, I think, a motivation for being the kind of country that we know we can be. So thanks all for being here. It's the first step on a pretty long journey, but it's very, very important that we take it. Thank you. Yeah.